this, as you see on the screen, the subject for the grand round is uh, four wheel development. Uh, it's an update and it's going to be presented by Dr. Rola ba Abbad. Uh, Dr. Abbad is a consultant ophthalmologist at uh, King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital uh, at uh, Retina Division. Uh, she has joined the division uh, recently, but she's not new to KCASH. Uh, she's a, a veteran ophthalmologist uh, at KCASH. Uh, she has completed her specialist training at uh, KCASH uh, and affiliated hospitals in Riyadh in 2006. And then uh, <clears throat> she has worked in uh, uh, she has worked in leading medical institutions, including Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and uh, King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital. Uh, she holds a PhD degree from University College London, and she got it in 2018. And uh, she's a fellow of Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow since 2011. Uh, she has undertaken research in inherited retinal disorders, visual neuroscience and clinical psychophysics and electrophysiology of vision. And uh, she published her research on uh, leading journals uh, in ophthalmologic field. So, uh, okay, Doctor, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Tashkintuna. Um, it's a it's pleasure and uh, also uh, it's really uh, difficult to, uh, to slow the rhythm after the, uh, the lecture by Prof. Abul Asrar. Uh, I'm sure it was uh, full of action, as everyone probably agrees with me. Uh, we don't have any growing microaneurysms here. We've got a fovea that's developing very slowly um, right from the beginning, um, from an embryonic stage. Uh, so uh, why, why this topic at this uh, point in time? I think it's relevant to understand the origins of, of the morphology of the retina as we see it every day in the retina clinic on OCT. Uh, it also has some clinical implications and uh, this will come later in the talk. And also, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if we were to adapt any uh, clinical trials for uh, gene therapy after Luxterna, I think uh, it might, or, or uh, any, any further uh, therapeutic modalities, um, uh, an important endpoint now, especially in the field of inherited retinal disease, is actually looking at the uh, cone and rod mosaic in, in the living retina, and this is by the means of adaptive optics. So um, I think from a futuristic point of view, um, let's go back to basics and uh, see where we, we can take it from there. So I'm going to talk today, I mean, uh, hopefully it's going to be a short and, um, and uh, you know, concise talk, although the topic is huge. Um, we're going to talk about the understanding of the foveal morphology and development. Uh, some uh, hints about foveal anomalies, foveal hypoplasia, and uh, the visual significance of uh, such changes. So um, this is uh, an image of a cadaveric eye, a human eye that shows uh, basically that the fovea is the central point of the visual field. Uh, so basically, the image is being focused by the optics of the eye uh, directly onto the central part of the macula. Um, roughly speaking, the distance between the center of the optic disc and the center of the fovea is about, you know, 15 degrees of visual angle. And this might become handy when you design any, say, for example, grids for, um, for micropermetry, for example, you want to co-localize with your OCT and things like that. So this is a rough guide that helps. So basically, the fovea is at the center of the macula. So if you subdivide the macula into several regions, you have the foveola, which is the, uh, the, the bottom or, uh, or the, the, the lowermost uh, point of, of the macular mound. And uh, this is at the center of the fovea. And uh, you have there the uh, um, rod-free zone and S-cone free zone as well. And then this is surrounded by the fovea itself, the foveal slope, the parafovea, and then the periphovea region. Um, 
So it's always nice to see that one of the reasons that OCT became validated and this, I mean, I was, I was lucky enough and old enough to actually witness the introduction of the uh, first OCT machines actually in, in, in Riyadh uh, at the University Hospital uh, and, and Kekesh. And uh, you can see that there is a, a close correspondence between the foveal histology uh, and, and the OCT, although that the OCT, we know it, it's actually a mathematical um, correlation actually between several B scans. Uh, and, uh, but yet you can still see that when you look here, uh, staining with green for the uh, cone arrestin, you can see despite the, the uh, splitting of the retina after processing, you can see the outer segment of the cone uh, mosaic here, and you can appreciate the foveal pit, which exactly corresponds to this region. Um, so again, looking uh, closely, you can see the central cone bouquet, and at this stage you can appreciate, number one, that actually these are the nuclei of the uh, cone photoreceptors, and uh, these are the outer segments, and you can see this kind of what, what's called the foveal bulge there. And uh, the other thing is that aside from the nuclei of the, of the cone photoreceptors, uh, basically the other nuclei are just, um, you know, uh, belong to the Muller cells that actually accompany the uh, fibers um, or the axons, uh, the elongated axons of the cones uh, in the fovea. So it's completely exclusive of cells except for the uh, photoreceptors and the supporting Muller cells. And this is even a more beautiful uh, unfast image uh, for a whole mountain in, in the macaque retina. And you can appreciate that the Henle fiber layer is quite short actually at the center. So the axons of the most central uh, foveolar photoreceptors are incredibly short and they are directly uh, um, connected to the, uh, to the corresponding um, uh, bipolar and ganglion cells. But then as you move, as you increase the eccentricity from, from the center, you would notice that the axons are, uh, the Henle fiber layer uh, is actually stretching far beyond what you would just uh, anticipate. And this is something that you may notice in OCT, especially when you tilt the scan sideways and you see this hyper-reflective band, um, just vitriate of the outer nuclear layer. So how does this foveal pit develop and what's the significance? So one of the things that um, struck me when I started my PhD and uh, uh, the first project that I handled was actually reconstruction of the foveal pit using uh, 2D images um, is that the fovea is something that uh, only human beings, primates, and not all primates either, and birds share. So the rest of the animal kingdom and mammals uh, the closest to human beings actually do not have a fovea. And there is a reason for that, um, you know, highly specialized region why human beings and, and birds and primates only enjoy this uh, uh, advantage. So it starts very early on from the uh, fetal week, and this is actually um, a histological section from a fetal retina um, at the week of 22. And you appreciate here that the ganglion cell layer. Um, uh, inner nuclear layer, outer nuclear layer, and probably the, there aren't even outer segments for the, uh, for the cone photoreceptors. These cells have just emerged literally from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the cell cycle, and the ganglion cell layer is, is quite thick. Um, there isn't much of an appreciation of a fovea at all. But then as the embryo grows, now you can appreciate that uh, actually the dip starts or the foveal pit starts to form. And again, you can see also that the uh, foveal, uh, the, uh, the outer nuclear layer is very, very close to the RPE and there isn't much of uh, an outer segment developing there. Um, um, it just progresses with time. And towards the postnatal day, then you can start to appreciate that there might be, uh, you know, something between the outer nuclear layer and the, and the pigment epithelium. And towards maturity, the full maturity of the, uh, of the fovea, you know, is reached at the age of 13 years. So it takes very, very long time for the uh, fovea to develop completely. And you can appreciate now that if we go back here, uh, the outer nuclear layer was a single um, cell layer, but now it's actually quite dense and they're quite packed and elongated, unlike the cuboidal cells that we started off with. 
And you appreciate also that at 15 months, now you can see proper inner segment and outer segment in those photoreceptors. And this actually correlates very well with the maturity of vision in, um, in infants. So it's not only a cortical um, maturation, it's also correlated with the foveal maturation in those, um, in those little children. So probably those who are interested in OCT and geography might also uh, find this interesting. And uh, this is even before <coughs> OCTA technology became available using confocal microscopy and immune staining for uh, collagen type 4. You appreciate the intricacy of, of, the, um, of the vasculature in the retina, but specifically also that you have um, the foveal vascular zone uh, right there. And you can see that the blood vessels neatly stop short of, of the foveal pit. And we are going to just, uh, you know, touch over the probable reasons that this happened. Uh, could you please mute yourself, whoever is talking now, please? Dr. Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so, um, we know from, from, from histology and now from also uh, OCT and geography, which, which gives more granularity than even um, FFA, is that we have two levels of inner retinal circulation. So we have the, uh, the innermost and the middle retinal circulation. And um, for the foveal vascular zone to develop, actually, both the innermost and the middle retinal circulation have to actually stop short of the foveal pit which also might become handy in future research into this topic. So the, what does the fovea vascular zone do basically? It confers elasticity to the incipient fovea. So one of the mechanical theories of development of fovea pit is that uh, um, the network of blood vessels actually confers a level of rigidity to the retina. The, the tissue itself is not as malleable uh, uh, when, when you have blood vessels and network of blood vessels in it. And, and one of the reasons uh, for that is that actually the blood vessels come along with astrocytes inside the retina. And uh, okay, so, so what if you, you I mean, the, okay, what, what if you don't develop blood vessels right at the middle of the fovea? It means that if there are any mechanical forces that actually pushes the retinal layers, inner retinal layers away, uh, the weak point, the more malleable point in, in the center is actually more likely to develop this relative ischemia and the blood vessels will be pushed away. So this is one of the mechanical theories of the development of the foveal pit. But then also from, from a, um, an optical point of view, uh, if you uh, look at the, say for example, adaptive optics images of, of the human retina, you would notice that despite that, the retinal photoreceptor mosaic is, is completely intact. There is always shadowing by the, by the blood vessels uh, overlying the photoreceptors underneath, and practically these are scotomata. But our brain is clever enough to actually um, not to, otherwise we will be walking around seeing you know, our own blood vessels. And this is something you can induce actually by your entoptic phenomena. So if you just touch a torch um, of light uh, next to your eye with your eyes closed and just move it sideways, you will appreciate seeing your own blood vessels. And that's, that's what I meant by that, they're scotomata. So imagine that you have a large blood vessel just crossing over your fovea and this interferes with your vision every time you try to look at something. But also, whenever you have blood vessels in a retina, in a part of the retina, then you wouldn't develop a foveal pit there because the, the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells are going to be nourished by uh, by the blood uh, coming from, from these blood vessels, and eventually they will not degenerate or retract to the edges as happens in the foveal pit. So are there any other uh, reasons that we develop a FAS? So one of the um, uh, suppressors of endothelial cell growth in the retina is actually the pigment helial derived factor, which is also uh, expressed by the ganglion cells. And also, as I mentioned, the astrocytes kind of um, make a scaffold for the vasculature, you know, the growing blood vessels. Uh, so there are some um, axon guidance factors like efferents, for example, in the retina that are um, tem temporarily expressed in the retina that repel the astrocytes from invading the center of the fovea. 
So we mentioned the uh, mechanical theory. So where does the pressure come from? Naturally, the intraocular pressure as, uh, as it builds up inside the eye. Uh, and later on, as the eye starts to grow, and that's why probably the foveal development is completed by the age of 13, one of the many reasons is that the tangential growth or tangential stretching by the ocular growth can actually stretch this region. And that's why the fovea starts off uh, a bit uh, narrow, but then it becomes wider as uh, the child grows. Um, so, so that's one factor. The second factor is that, um, so in addition to the pit itself, there, there are quite a few modifications of the cone photoreceptors. And that includes the packing, which sometimes can be completely separate from the development of the pit. And you see this in some patients with um, mild ocular uh, or oculocutaneous albinism, where they have some pigmentation that allows packing and elongation of the photoreceptors. And yet you can see a layer uh, of ganglion cells and by, you know, an, an outer and inner nuclear layer uh, still furnishing the center of the fovea. And typically in those patients, actually the visual acuity might be slightly better than those with complete foveal hyperplasia. Um, the other reason that the cones kind of are packed and cramped together, become elongated, is that they also change in shape as they grow, as I have shown in the previous slide, uh, that the cuboidal shape is actually changed into an elongated configuration, and this allows more space for packing of the photoreceptors. Um, typically, it's um, it's more than uh, 30,000 uh, cone photoreceptor in, in 100 microns and a square 100 uh, microns uh, region. And, and that's why uh, counting the cone photoreceptors right at the dead center of the foveola is quite challenging, even using adaptive optics uh, imaging. So, um, okay, so uh, what does that all mean? And, uh, you know, what does this have to do with the retinal circuitry and why? there is a, a, a relatively larger area of the visual cortex just dedicated to serve the foveal representation. Well, the reason for that is that you have uh, the midget uh, cyst pathway and as opposed to the parasol pathway. So just to refresh your memory a bit about um, you know, basic science, uh, the midget pathway is, uh, midget means um, actually kind of uh, a dwarf. And um, the reason that they're called so is that they are tiny uh, bipolar cells and tiny ganglion cells. So the fovea is quite privileged to have like a private uh, line. So each foveal cone is actually connected to two bipolar cells on and off bipolar cells. And each of, of, uh, and each of the bipolar cells is connected to the um, receptive field of uh, a midget ganglion cell. And this gives you high resolution, as opposed to the parasol system, where you have diffuse bipolar cells converging on, onto a large number of photoreceptors. If you have this rate of convergence, like 1 to 10, for example, you will find that it's really difficult to mobilize cellular elements around and kind of pack the cells and so on, as I just described. But if you have a 1 to 1 or even 1 to 2 pathway, it's easy to push the cells away and uh, you push the inner retinal cells away and push the photoreceptors together uh, in two opposite uh, directions, and uh, this can be feasible. And this has been uh, elegantly uh, described and, and, and illustrated by the Provis et al. Uh, group, including uh, Dr. Adam Dugas, who currently is working in UCL in London. So basically, the forces here come from uh, the side, basically, that the, uh, the photoreceptors are cramped together. And you can see that the vasculature stops short of uh, the center. And then you have the vertical uh, force coming from, basically, the intraocular pressure pushing the cellular el elements away. And this is sort of, uh, you know, counter forces. So from the inner retina, actually, the force is going tangentially, uh, centrifugally while uh, the, the outer retina is actually, uh, the cells are moving centripetally until the foveal pit is, is completely carved and you can see the stretching of the Henle fiber layer on either side. So what does that mean when it comes to clinical practice? Well, I mean, there have been um, uh, quite a lot of advances and one of them is the handheld OCT, which has been used by several groups studying the retinopathy of prematurity both in the United States, Canada, and the UK. And, and basically, when you look at um, a, a newborn uh, baby at uh, 38 weeks, 
you would notice here that the outer nuclear layer is quite thin and you might think to yourself, man, I mean, this, this chap doesn't have a fovea at all and uh, probably the photoreceptors are damaged or something. But it's just normal at this stage because as the child grows, then you start seeing actually an increase in the thickness of the outer nuclear layer uh, gradually, uh, in addition to also the growth and development of uh, mature uh, um, inner uh, lipsoid zone, as you can see it eventually in adults. But this takes time, and this should be appreciated uh, in case you handle patients with retinopathy or prematurity before you counsel the family and give them uh, sometimes, you know, a negative view, despite that time would tell whether actually the fovea has developed normally or not in them. And so instead of saying like, okay, here is mild foveal hypoplasia, severe, moderate, and so on, actually, you know, using some sort of a classification system uh, amongst uh, researchers and also clinicians might also help to uh, sort things out. So this illustrates uh, the, the stages of foveal hypoplasia stage uh, 1A and 1B are the mildest basically. Uh, while stage four is a complete absence of the foveal development altogether. As you can see here, one major difference between the stage three and stage four is that the elongation of the outer nuclear layer is present in stage three, while it's not in stage four. And it's claimed that uh, one of the reasons in patients with uh, albinism, uh, oculocutaneous in, in case of the X-linked form or the oclo, um, um, uh, sorry, recessive form uh, or, or ocular albism in the case of the X-linked form, is that patients who do have um, uh, the elongation of the outer nuclear layer and a, a very, very tiny rudimentary for VL pit do fare better and have better acuity and rarely even do not even have uh, nystagmus. The reason for that might not be related to the um, chiasmal misrouting or any other changes that have been uh, already reported and studied extensively. It might be uh, because the, the receptive field size of the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells in those patients is more or less close to what normal should be like rather than the cone packing itself. It's just a matter of convergence. So the higher the convergence rate, the less the acuity is, and that's why we see better when we use our central macula, but the peripheral retina doesn't see as well. So you can talk now about um, a few cases of um, anomalous foveal development, and the classic example I just mentioned, albinism. Uh, suffice it to say, as a clinician, uh, when you see somebody with oculocutaneous albinism, you ask about two things, uh, just to make sure that you are not really uh, dealing with a syndromic form, Shidia Kigashi or Hermansky Podlak. And uh, you ask also about the family history because uh, there is an X linked form of albinism that you shouldn't miss and counsel patients in terms of uh, recessive disorder. Uh, so if, if you are in the clinic and you are handling a patient with albinism, probably these are the questions that you might need to ask. Um, uh, PAX-6 variants are uh, sometimes sporadic. They are inherited as autosomal dominant. So, uh, and not everybody has got an aridia and not everybody has got Holmes tumor. Uh, so you need to look at the variant. You need to look at the mode of inheritance and uh, bear in mind also that uh, sometimes uh, de novo mutations in this gene can uh, arise. Um, another exciting gene that hopefully uh, our paper is going to come out um, hopefully uh, within the coming few months uh, is a gene called SLC38A8 and uh, it's inherited as an autosomal dominant form. Patients can present with uh, nystagmus, uh, anterior segment dysgenesis, but not always, and chiasmal misrouting, but they do not have any signs uh, of albinism at all. And uh, recently, uh, Irene Gottlob and, and her group also reported uh, uh, recessive variants in the gene uh, that encodes for aryl um, hydrocarbon receptor, and uh, it causes foveal hypoplasia and infantile nystagmus without chiasma misrouting, which you can detect on uh, multi-channel DAT. The other thing that uh, is worth mentioning is that don't panic when you see somebody with uh, absent foveal pit or very shallow foveal pit as long as the vision is fine. Just leave them alone. And uh, th there has been an, uh, an interesting study by uh, Dr. Mark, um, Mike Marmor 
from the University of Stanford, uh, actually doubting that the foveal tip itself uh, has uh, any advantage other than uh, the fact that it's a sign of development. And, and I mean, for via planet, usually they do not have dense uh, uh, vascularization of the, of the retina. And they, still, they may still have a foveal vascular zone despite the persistence of the inner retinal layers. It's quite interesting also that patients with nanophthalmia and, and microphthalmia might also have a very, very small or uh, absent uh, foveal pit. But I think the visual deficit in them is not related to, to the foveal uh, hypoplasia itself. But this needs to be researched, and this is an interesting question to answer. Uh, we mentioned ROP. We mentioned also some cases of achromatopsia, especially those associated with a gene called APF6, and some cases of uh, incomplete CSMB uh, due to the, the variance in the gene CAC now and if. So just for uh, the clinicians uh, who uh, use Optus regularly, and uh, if you have a crying child and uh, you want to just quickly to see what's happening, especially children with, with nystagmus, you want to, before you order an ERG, you want to examine the patient properly. And before you tell the, pay, you know, the family bad news that their child might have cone dystrophy or uh, LCA or something, just take a good look at the retina and take a, um, an optus image, which can be quite easy even in babies. And uh, one of the features that you might see in those patients is the concentric rings if you happen to encounter a patient with foveal hypoplasia. So putting one and one together, the vasculature is not attenuated. The child has got nystagmus, yes, but then you have this foveal hypoplasia. You might think that this child, rather than having LCA, is just having albinism which I think is much more uh, happy news to the family after you confirm by ERG, obviously, uh, that their child is not likely to be blind. And um, this study actually went to the length of actually doing UNFAS uh, OC, uh, OCT and correlate that with, um, with the Optus images. And you can see that in all of those patients who happen to have these concentric rings, you can see it on UNFAS OCT, and they correlated that with the Henle fiber layer resistance in the center. As we mentioned, it's quite short normally in the center, but in those patients, probably it has a different configuration. And uh, this is something worth looking for if you manage to get good images. So I will just conclude my talk by, um, you know, a quick uh, chart. So if you see a patient with a continuation of the inner retinal layers, um, just uh, if there is um, such thing, then you consider foveal hypoplasia. You take a good family history. Uh, you consider use, uh, doing a VEP to look for chiasma misrouting, uh, and you can uh, select um, you know, which path to go. And if you notice also abnormal retinal lamination or uh, disruption at the level of the outer retina, even in the presence of foveal hypoplasia, you might consider inherited retinal disease uh, and then uh, probably achromatopsia uh, should come in, in the list of your differential. Uh, and then you can take it from there, ordering your ERG, and eventually you can narrow down your differential before you order uh, a genetic panel for the patient. That's all I have today. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, to you for this excellent and uh, very interesting lecture about foveal, foveal development. Uh, I just want to open the floor for uh, questions or any other uh talk about the uh, subject any questions hi this is dr noelati may i ask a question yeah please sure, go, go ahead. ahead yeah yes thank you dr Bu'abad. Ex most excellent lecture i've learned a lot um, I was very interested uh, uh, to find that uh, the foveal development goes um, up to 13 years before it's uh, fully mature. So does that mean that our thinking of amblyopia is, is not exactly correct? Well, with the, you know, with, uh, th does the foveal development have, have a role in amblyopia? Um, 
Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, uh, fovea, if the fovea develops normally, I mean, one of the reasons that foveal uh, hypoplasia has been correlated with, with poor vision in patients with albinism is that also that they may have, in addition to the chiasmal misrouting, also some sort of uh, problem uh, when it comes to the convergence of, of the bipolar cells onto a larger number than, than usual of, of the photoreceptors. And this actually kind of blurs the image and therefore amblyopia might have set in uh, early on in those patients. And this mm -hmm. is sort of a counter argument in those who aim to treat um, albinism or, or think that they can improve the vision. Um, this is a very, very long answer to a very short question that was um, quite interesting. I think that uh, amblyopia does not set in as long as the fovea develops normally and, and wires normally. Uh, so if the fovea does not develop normally, does this cause amblyopia? Possibly, because basically amblyopia is, is a central nervous system response rather than something related to the eye itself directly but the eye can set it off when there is something going wrong. But mm -hmm. uh, simply just a uh, fovea, foveal development setting amblyopia, I, I don't think that under normal circumstances that that happens. Do you, do you think that uh, the visual feedback to the, to the brain, uh, if, it's, if it's blurry, do you think that will have an effect on foveal development or not at all? Because we see a lot of kids who have amblyopia and whose, whose OCTs are normal. Is, does, do you think there's an, a, like a um, feedback effect or no? Uh, I don't think it has such a huge influence because the feed forward mechanisms and, and, and including also the axon guidance early on in the visual development is actually starting from the eye towards the brain, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have one question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rula Baba. It was really great presentation. Um, I just want to ask uh, one question, which is in continuation to what Dr. Nawilari was asking. Um, I'm interested really in amblyopia, and I just wanted to know if there is any ongoing. Uh, uh, research uh, trying to uh, figure out if there are any structural or electrophysiological abnormalities in the fovea in patients with amblyopia. Uh, so patients with amblyopia, when you do their ERG, their ERG, fulfilled ERG is normal. Uh, the problem with pattern ERG, for example, which um, uh, I advocate more than actually using multifocal ERG in such cases, is that it tests um, only the ganglion cell bipolar cell cone function in the macula itself, and it's got nothing to do with the central uh, visual system response. But if you do pattern um, uh, appearance VEP, which is basically if you rule out structural changes and uh, if the patient happens to be lucky enough to have good fixation, because for pattern ERG you need good fixation, um, in an ideal situation, you will find that the pattern appearance VEP, which is used uh, using a checkerboard of variable sizes and also contrast level, is quite reduced. And this also correlates with the early work in, in monkeys, where actually uh, abnormalities of the lateral geniculate body are, have been demonstrated in, in monkeys with deprivation amblyopia. So to cut it short, I don't think that amblyopia is an ocular problem inside the eye itself. It's something beyond the ganglion cells. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other question? Uh, I would like to thank you, Doctora, for your answers and uh, the, both Doctoras Novilati and Swalem for their questions. Uh, no more questions. If uh, nothing, no, no more questions. Uh, I would like to end uh, this session. And uh, I don't know if the weekly quiz is ready or not, but uh, we are finishing the grand round. Thank you for so much for participation.